Hello, deserving listeners. It is just me today. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I am your loyal and dedicated host, Kirk Honda, who also has a doctorate degree. Therefore, I can call myself Dr. Kirk Honda. And I am a professor at Antioch University Seattle in the Couple and Family Therapy Program. And I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist in Washington State, practicing in Seattle, Washington. This episode is about the movie Ingrid Goes West. It's a movie that came out in 2017, uh, a number of months ago. And patron Bonnie actually asked me to do an episode on it. She says, hey, Dr. Honda, I was wondering if you could do an episode on on the psychology of the main character of the film Ingrid Goes West. I was very, very intrigued to know what could be wrong with with this character in terms of diagnosis. I think the character was very, very well written, but at the same time, I'm curious to know if she fits any particular diagnostic criteria. End of email. So yeah, Bonnie, I will absolutely do that today. So let's get into it. Let's talk about the the movie itself here. It got 85% on Rotten Tomatoes. I rated it an eight out of 10 which I do not rate many movies 8 out of 10. Uh, a lot of movies that I see, because I, I usually pick movies pretty well, and t- I, I, I know how to avoid movies I don't like. And so if I liked a movie, I give it a 7. Uh, it's a, a 7 is a very typical number I give it. If I thought it was okay, and maybe a rental, if you didn't have anything else to watch, I, it's like a 5. Anything below a five, I can I consider that a, 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 a to some degree a waste of time. If if I give it a four, that's like I wish I hadn't have wasted my time. I just watched um, today this morning. I watched uh, Free Fire. That's a movie that came out recently. Free Fire. It has Brie Larson in it. Anyway, I gave that I think a two or three out of ten. It had a very interesting set up. It's sort of a fishbowl movie. I can't remember what they call it, but it's all the characters are stuck in this warehouse and everyone's trying to kill each other. It's sort of like a Quentin Tarantino movie in that way. The problem is, is, is a very thin premise that does not sustain it through an hour and a half. And it, w- it just got so boring so quick and so ludicrous too, because the characters shot hundreds and hundreds of rounds even though logic would have it that they would only have probably the bullets that were in the gun that they actually had on them. Like the fact that they had a revolver and like, you know, boxes and boxes of ammo in their coat jacket was just ludicrous to me. Um, Plus it was just boring. You know, I'll, I'll forgive the ammo issue as long as the movie is good. But anyway, it's really boring. Anyway, let's get back to, Ingrid Goes West. So I gave it an 8 out of 10, which means I, I really liked it. Written and directed by Matt Spicer. He This was his first feature film. And he's a young American director. I'm excited to see what he does next. Um, it stars Aubrey Plaza. You might know her from Parks and Rec, in which she was super funny in Parks and Rec, Aubrey Plaza. I don't think I have seen an Aubrey Plaza production that I did not like. She's been in a handful of movies that I've seen, and all of them I've just adored. I think she she's just a she has a very particular comedy way about her that is a, sort of a through line through all the different movies she's in. And if you're into that sort of thing, then you're going to like this movie too. This this movie is a bit of a further uh, it's a it's a it's a divergence from the normal Aubrey Plaza situation. The movie also has Elizabeth, Elizabeth Olsen, who is a younger sister of the Olsen twins, Billy Magnuson, and Wyatt Russell, the son of Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn, and also a former professional ice hockey player. Didn't know that. The movies from, that I remember Wyatt Russell from are Everybody Wants Some, which is a Linkletter movie that came out last year about uh, minor league baseball, and also Black Mirror, if you remember the play tester, play testing episode 2016, Wyatt Russell. It also has the movie also stars Palm Clementif, who is a Hapa, half Korean, half white actress who is Mantis in Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume Two. 
if you remember her, she's she's the Asian girl with antennae. <laughs> but anyway, she she's half Korean, half white, uh, French Canadian. And it also stars O'Shea, O'Shea Jackson Jr., who is the son of O'Shea Jackson, other, otherwise known as Ice Cube. So the son of Ice Cube, who looks exactly like, like Ice Cube. You might remember O'Shea Jackson Jr. from um, Straight Outta Compton, the movie. He played his father, Ice Cube. Okay, so let's so let's go over this this movie and the plot. I'm going to spoil it, you know, but I imagine it's not the sort of movie where spoiling really matters. So basically the story goes, Ingrid, played by Aubrey Plaza. So I'll just refer to it as Aubrey Plaza. <laughs> so Aubrey Plaza, she doesn't have any friends and her mother died and left her some money, $60,000. And the movie starts off with a girl named Charlotte commented on one of her posts. So Aubrey Plaza is like, ooh, this, this girl commented on one of my posts. And then Aubrey Plaza pursues this sort of one-sided friendship with her. And Charlotte's like, get away from me. And then Charlotte eventually gets married. And then, and then Aubrey Plaza shows up to the wedding and she's really angry and she uh, sprays mace in her face during the wedding because she's really angry at her for not inviting her to the, the wedding. So right off the bat, we see this scene where we understand that Aubrey Plaza is very vindictive and obsesses on particular uh, people as friends and is, is an outcast and very lonely. So, so Aubrey Plaza after this, so her mother's dead. She has this money and she's, she's kind of depressed and she discovers Taylor Sloan, who's played by Elizabeth Olsen, whom I'll just refer to as Elizabeth Olsen, Olsen, the younger sister of the Olsen twins. Uh, I am the cute one, if you remember that story, that song. Okay, so Aubrey Plaza discovers social media influencer uh, named Taylor Sloan, who's played by Elizabeth Olsen. So this is one of those things like, that has only emerged in the last 10 years or so, you know, a social media influencer, right? So, someone who uh, potentially might even make a living off of their blog about where they eat and what sort of clothes they wear and what books they read. And with the idea that so many people are following them and will run out and do whatever they're doing. Right. And so, you know, uh, Elizabeth Olsen goes to, a, a nightclub and says, Oh my God, this is the best. And then everyone else shows up there later. And so, uh, and I, so I think, so that's her job and that's what she does in Los Angeles. And so Elizabeth Olsen responds to uh, Aubrey Plaza online, just, you know, just sort of Elizabeth Olsen just sort of reaches out to some of her fans and Aubrey Plaza instantly becomes obsessed with her. She's like, Oh my God, this famous person responded to me, you know, responded to me online. And so Aubrey Plaza picks up and moves to LA and is in, and she's like, I'm going to meet Elizabeth Olsen. I'm going to become, become friends with her. And she somehow, she, she uses some detective work and figures out how to work her way into Elizabeth Olsen's life. And she ends up kidnapping her dog. And then when she, when Elizabeth Olsen puts up flyers, uh, Aubrey Plaza says, "Hey, I found your dog! Oh my God, your dog was wandering around!" And and uh, Elizabeth Olsen is like, "Let me let me pay you. Let me give you the reward." And Aubrey Plaza is like, "No, that's okay. How about we just you know hang out for a bit and get to know each other?" And Elizabeth Olsen and, and um, Wyatt Russell are like, "Okay, fine," because that's Elizabeth Olsen's boyfriend and they be they quickly become best friends they're very similar they're very into their phones they're very into instagram they're very catty against other people and they they just and aubrey plaza sort of uh is very deferential very worshiping of elizabeth olsen and elizabeth olsen likes that and um and and Aubrey Plaza starts screwing over everyone just so she can like make sure that her relationship with Elizabeth Olsen, this social media influencer is strong. 
And then, so everything's going perfectly. And Aubrey Plaza is like, oh my God, I have a best friend and she's great. And I finally feel good about myself and I can relax and we can have fun. And this is just the best. And then enter plot point. Elizabeth Olson, Elizabeth Olson's bully kind of privileged white boy brother uh, enters the story. And he's instantly uh, weirded out by Aubrey Plaza. He's just like, what is this new girl like doing around my sister? Just hanging around her all the time. And he starts to look into her and he figures out that she is actually um, a, a stalker, essentially. The, this brother kind of does some internet Googling and like, wait a second, this Aubrey Plaza girl, this Ingrid is she's not who she says she is. She's actually, she's just a fan of Elizabeth Olsen and she sort of wormed her way into her life. And so, so Ingrid doesn't like that. Aubrey Plaza's character doesn't like it. She's like, Oh, this brother is interfering with my relationship with my best friend. And you know, she becomes quite panicked and upset. And, and so the, the brother starts to influence Elizabeth Olsen to move away from Ingrid, away from Aubrey Plaza. And, Aubrey starts to freak out and Elizabeth Olsen is like, Oh wait. So Aubrey Plaza isn't so she says, she says, says she is. And then Aubrey Plaza kidnaps the brother and tries to make him be quiet about it, essentially trying to intimidate him into, you know, being afraid to say anything. And there's a scuffle and something kind of goes wrong. And then Aubrey Plaza hits him in the head with a crowbar to get him to, you know, be quiet or something. And we never find out in the movie whether or not she killed him or not, you know. So it's possible that she actually killed him, um, but we don't. I mean, she, she at the very least hurt him very badly. So then later, um, Elizabeth Olsen, uh, regardless of, of Aubrey Plaza getting this brother to shut up. Elizabeth Olsen eventually is just like, eh, moving on. I, I'm not going to hang out with Aubrey Plaza anymore. And so Aubrey Plaza's character, Ingrid, her life starts to fall apart. And she becomes very depressed and she doesn't know what to do. But, you know, as soon as her very temporary best friend rejects her, she falls apart. She doesn't know what to do. And so at a certain point, she desperately she she's running out of money and eventually she just de decides she's going to kill herself she's just like that's it i'm i'm very distraught i'm very distressed that I, I no one likes me my my last two best friends were just fake p best friends and i can't even seem to manage that i'm just a terrible person and so this there's this really uh, from my memory anyway very accurate, heart-wrenching scene in which she prepares to kill herself. But, but she does it on live stream because that's how she interacts with the world. So she says, okay, I'm going to die. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post this for everyone to see because I just want to be honest. And for the first time, she's really honest. You know, instead of trying to portray herself as some you know, special, happy, awesome person. She, she presents herself in this raw, honest way and tries to kill herself. And she seems from my memory again, legitimately remorseful for her actions and, and really, really sad. It's, it's just a very sad scene. Well, Ice Cube's son, the character is, is watching the live stream of it and somehow figures out a way to rescue her, sends an aid car or something. And so she doesn't, she doesn't end up dying. And she wakes up in the hospital and learns that he had saved her. And she is like, well, what's the point of living? I mean, okay, you saved me. Great. But my life is still crap. And I'm humi now I'm doubly humiliated because people on the internet now know how stupid I am. But then, she, but then he's like, no, no, you don't understand. You're, you're, while you've been unconscious, you've been in a coma for a bit, your video went viral and you're internet famous now and everyone is sending their support and everyone loves you and you're a beacon 
for all those people who feel like they're misfits and they're outsiders. And the movie ends with her smiling about that. And then the movie ends. So it's a dark ending. You know, so this, so throughout the movie with Aubrey Plaza, you're just like, man, she is a devious, manipulative, insecure person who is deciding to obsess on people who are very shallow. So there's really not a lot of redeeming. The only person who I think the writer and director really wanted us to identify with was O'Shea Jackson Jr., Ice Cube's son. He's the only one who is genuine and nice and honest and giving and forgiving. Everyone else is shallow. And I guess Wyatt Russell's character is kind of cool too. But but most the two main characters, Aubrey Plaza and Elizabeth Olsen, just they it's hard to like them. And so throughout the movie you're just you're just watching this and then she her life goes down the tubes and you're like, well, I don't know, you kind of deserved that because you lied and you may have even killed somebody. So, you know, your life sort of deserves to go down the tubes. And then she, uh, in a desperation, tries to kill herself. And then that ironically leads to this really good thing happening for her, which was all of this internet attention and all this, you know, all what she always wanted to be, because she always wanted to be like an Elizabeth Olsen. She wanted all that accolade on the internet. And then the movie just ends. Okay. So, the response was there was a lot of criticism because people are saying that this movie glamorizes mental illness. And so these are some quotes of, of what people were saying. Matt Spicer, uh, Matt Spicer, he's the writer director, Matt Spicer, a young white man sold a comedic depiction of a young woman with a mental illness for profit. Unquote. So this is a part of a over, you know a larger article in which the author is trying to say that Matt Spicer doesn't understand what he's doing and that he's a privileged young white man and that he is making fun of mental illness and it made him a lot of money. Okay, another person said, or maybe the same person. I just have a bunch of quotes here. The implication that a person living with mental illness needs only the validation of a bunch of anonymous follow followers to feel better and go on with their lives is not is not only absurd, but insulting as it downplays the seriousness of mental illness. So in this quote, the person is saying, you know, at the end, she gets she gets all these she gets all this Internet attention. And that's and then this person's and that's what they're saying is like. Matt Spicer seems to think that this would solve her problems. And that's stupid because, of course, internet attention will not solve your problems. Another quote here. The fact that suicide is handled in such a flippant way is not terribly surprising since suicide has always been romanticized in movies, but it's particularly troubling to see it handled so casually in this day and age. Unquote. So... This quote is saying that the movie handles suicide flippantly and that there's a lot of very flippant suicide depictions as of late. Essentially, it's a kids today argument. Kids today don't know how to make movies. They don't know how to depict suicide in a responsible way. Okay, so let me address this. First off, I completely disagree (laughs) with these things. It you know this Ingrid Goes West this movie it's a piece of art and when you watch it you're going to see something different than when I watch it which is something different than whoever wrote this article saw when they when they saw it so you know it you can't it's hard to say what is reality when it comes to this movie but in my opinion when I watched it as a person who works in mental health I did not feel as though it it depicted mental illness in a, in a, in a bad way. The other thing here is that in all the articles that I read and I read dozens, none of them ever proposed what mental illness the movie was trying to portray. They just said, clearly Aubrey Plaza's character, Ingrid is mentally ill. And then they just sort of end there. And none of them, from what I remember, actually talked to an actual mental health clinician. It was just like a lot of, sort of movie reviewers and 
other kinds of people, uh, commenters, you know, editorial people just saying mental illness, mental illness, mental illness. And to me, the, the quote unquote mental illness that this is depicting is not, I, I don't consider it to be in the same class as like quote unquote other mental disorders, right? It, it's, um, it's a, which I'll get into more in a second, but anyway, but putting that aside, the fact that she needed a bunch of validation is a part of her disorder. So it ends. So it, so it all depends on how you see the ending. So if you see the ending as the moral, of the story is all you need is internet attention and everything's going to be okay. But to me, when the movie ended, I was like, oh, what a clever ending because she got what she wanted in the end, but it's an empty, it's, it's not a happy ending because very quickly Ingrid's life is going to spin out of control again. It, you know, she's not, the fact that she's getting internet uh, attention isn't going to solve her problems. Her, her issues of insecurity are going to persist and and that's not going to go away. And so to me, it was like, oh, Ing you know, as I'm watching it, I'm like, oh, no, Ingrid, you should not be smiling at this. This is not what you need. And how and how dark of an ending it was and how clever of a because, you know, whenever you write a movie or any story, you have to have some way of ending it, meaning that you can't in the middle of a story plot, just end the story, right? You have to have, you have to have it, the arc wrap up somehow. And so this is, this was a clever way of wrapping it up in terms of, you know, they could have had it end with her dying. Okay. That's one way. But instead it's like, Oh, actually her attempt to kill herself when she was totally honest and raw with the internet was actually a moment in which she finally got what she wanted, but what she wanted is not what she needs. So to me, that's how I saw it. So I didn't see it as an ir irresponsible ending at all. The other thing is, is this whole kids today not handling suicide in a responsible manner, I find to be not only kind of silly, but also a little repugnant because with the 13 Little Things Netflix show, there was a lot of, it was a lot of the same talk. There was just a ton of criticism for that show for de quote unquote depicting suicide in a flippant manner. And I, I'm here to tell you as someone who actually works with people who have suicidal ideation and has had clients attempt and complete suicide and has, and, and I've worked with hundreds of supervisees who have had suicidal clients my reaction to 13, 13 reasons why, 13 reasons why, and to Ingrid Goes West and the suicide it depicts, my reaction is like, oh, good. You're actually, we're actually talking about it now. <laughs> we're, we're actually showing what it's, what it's actually like. It's, it, in 13 reasons why, the suicide scene is anything but flippant. It is traumatic. In fact, I did a whole episode on that show and, and my, what I told people was, if you're even a little bit skittish about blood, do not watch that scene. Because I am not a person who shies away from violence in movies. I, I can watch, I, for the most part, I can watch pretty much any vi vi depiction of violence or suicide for that matter. And, and it'll affect me, but it won't, it won't traumatize me. This scene in 13 Reasons Why was mildly traumatizing to me. It was so realistic and so graphic, but realistic, you know, realistic, very realistic, but graphic that I was midway through the scene. I was like, Oh, I don't, I don't think I should be watching this. This is like going to damage my brain. It's too, it's too real, you know, because usually in the movies, when they depict suicide, someone jumps off a bridge or they cut their wrists, but they, but they'll see, they'll just show it real quick, you know, or they'll show a lot of blood, but they won't show like the anatomy involved, if you know what I'm saying. And those scenes can be very difficult to watch too, but 13 reasons why scene was pretty bad. In Inger Goes West, there's no, there's, there's no graphic violence of it, but in, but the movie does depict the, the downward spiral that Ingrid takes as she heads towards suicide. And 
just how fragile she was and just how how she she seemingly pushed herself into a corner and had nowhere to turn. In that way, I thought it really depicted it very well. And again, in my experience, accurately, in terms of the emotional vibe I got from that suicidal attempt. So, so but again, another clinician could look at it differently. But honestly, I, I think there's this, there's this um, societal reaction to suicide in any depiction of any situation in the negative because people don't want to acknowledge that suicide is a thing. And even though they don't consciously know they want to oppress and marginalize suicide, I think it sneaks out in their criticism of, of these sorts of depictions. I think there's this, you know, it's like, what about all the murder that happens in TVs and movies? Um, think if, if you were just to look at depictions of murder or of self-defense killing, you know, just people killing people with guns. If you think about all the, all the violence in which a gun is shot and someone is injured or died uh, and, you know, someone is injured or, or they die. <clears throat> uh, think about the various levels of flippancy versus seriousness versus responsible depictions of that. Well, I don't see a lot of people writing blogs and and articles, full articles about the way in which uh, a TV show or a movie is very flippant about gun violence, right? It's like, how come when we depict violence about suicide, it has to meet these impossible criteria in order for it to be good enough to have been made, right? Suicide is more prevalent than murder. I just want to repeat that. In most states, it's um, suicide is either at at the same rate of of murder, or it's high, or it's as as as, as much as double the rate. I think in Washington State, it's like twice as many people die from suicide as they do from homicide. I just want that to sink in. So how many suicides do you see on in movie and TV? How many homicides, meaning that someone kills someone else for whatever reason? How many homicides have you seen? The I, the, I think like the average teenager, 13 year old or something, I can't remember the exact stat, but in, in a year's time, they see thousands upon thousands thousands of homicides depicted on in movies and TV. You know, there's a lot of PG-13 movies where hundreds of people die in the span of, you know, the time of the movie. And, and yet, so, and because we're, we have this weird puritanical, I don't know, like religious resi- residue around suicide or something, or just unfamiliarity with suicide or something, we, we be, as a society, we become very skittish whenever suicide is discussed, depicted, particularly when young people are shown to uh, attempt suicide. And the reality is, is there's a lot of people who are, who are attempting and a lot more young people who are thinking about it. And we need to wake up to that and we need to stop uh, marginalizing and criticizing the messengers of that reality. And I think Ingrid Goes West depicts that well. Now, again, the way that I see it is that the suicide was a, uh, you know, a sort of bump in the road. And when she woke up, there were these quote unquote rewards for having attempted suicide in that everyone is now supporting her. But the way I see it is that pretty soon she's going to be thinking about suicide again anyway because she lacks a self. And let me get into like what mental illness, uh, quote unquote, she might be suffering from. Um, so, so first off, again, lots of people talking about mental illness without discussing what mental illness, which I find to be a little problematic because if you can't identify the mental illness, then why are you saying there's a mental illness? You know, like, unless you know what mental illness is, you're probably as a, as an online writer 
or as a magazine writer, you're probably just taking a guess that it's a mental illness. And I find that to be irresponsible. To, for, for writers and journalists to claim that Ingrid has a mental illness without consulting with someone about what mental illness and reporting on that, I, I find that to be irresponsible because I, it, I'll, I'll get into that more in a second. The other thing is that there's a lot of writing on the internet in, in journalists writing that Ingrid suffer, suffers from social media obsession and phone addiction, these kinds of things, but that's not it at all. One, she she uses her phone in a very typical way for certain kinds of people in our society. And to name it as social media obsession or phone addiction, again, is irresponsible because that's a judgment call on your part. You know, there's a lot of that going on right now where essentially older people or people who just don't use their phones very much looking at younger people and saying, Oh my God, phone addiction. And, you know, it's a very tricky subject because addiction is a very serious word. And just because you don't like someone doing something or you can't relate to it doesn't mean that they have an addiction. There are people who go golfing four times a week. And every time they go golfing, it's like, you know, three to five hours of activity. Well, I don't golf and I haven't golfed in 10 years. Do I look at that person and say they're addicted to golf? This person reads about golf, they look at articles about golf, they, you know, they, they're always looking for new putters and new drivers, and they like to talk about golf all the time. Would I say this person is a golf addict? No, they're just really into golf. That's it. <laughs> it, it I'd have to really be, I'd have to really assess this person, and I'd have to uh, really be convinced that they're totally obsessed with something that they don't want to be, or it's ruining their life somehow in this weird way. And so there's just a lot of talk about that, you know, porn addiction, masturbation addiction. There's just a lot of these words being thrown around in society. And I think as clinicians, we have to put an end to that. We have to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. How about you just say some other word other than addiction or obsession? How about you just say this person seems to be obsessed with social media or this person is on their phone a lot <laughs> or something, you know, phone addiction. I mean, come on. So, you know, knock it off. All right. So what mental illness? And if it's not so social media obsession or phone addiction, then what is it? Well, again, as if you listen to other podcast episodes, um, this is a borderline presentation and, uh, and let me explain. Um, and, and some of you might be thinking, do you see everything as borderline Kirk? <laughs> and you know, you can make an argument for that, but I think that borderline is one of those conditions that movies and TV shows and writers just love to depict for, even though they don't know they're necessarily depicting it. I think there's just, and I'll get more into that in a second, but let me go over like the borderline personality traits. Now, the way I see borderline is it's a personality, not necessarily a disorder. So, you know, the DSM likes to designate borderline as a disorder, but I consider borderline to be a spectrum. So, so you can have a little bit of borderline personality or a lot of borderline. And perhaps at the, at the a lot of borderline end of the spectrum, that's when you start qualifying for the personality disorder. Borderline originally was not a disorder. It was just a label that psychoanalysts and psychodynamic people put to a particular sort of personality, just like all, a lot of the other personalities. And then, and then at some point when the DSM was being constructed, they would adopt the, that personality language and they called these, these things personality disorders. And they tried to uh, codify them in behavioral criteria. But originally it was just a way of describing a particular personality you know, like extroverted or something. It's, it's just, you know, it's just, it's just a borderline personality and, and you look at the spectrum in which people are on. Okay. So how is she borderline? Well, she's clearly not securely attached and she clearly is in a, she's clearly desperate for attachment security. Another way of looking at borderline, if you're familiar with attachment theory is preoccupied, is a preoccupied insecure attachment style. It's someone who is 
is is really desperate for attachment security. They're looking for a loyal friend or family member. They're looking for someone who loves them unconditionally. Um, before moving forward, let's take a break. How about that? All right, we're back from the break. Before moving forward with the analysis of, of Ingrid's personality, just want to remind everyone to become a patron of the podcast. Go to patreon.com. When you become a patron of the podcast, you get access to all of our deep dive exclusive episodes. There's many, many of those. Also, go buy my book. It's called Multi-Role Clinical Supervision. And it's a book for supervisors and maybe therapists. And maybe if you're interested in the podcast, you might be interested in it as well. I think Amazon has it at $38, 35, $35 to $40, somewhere in there. And uh, so it's not too expensive. Also, we have a live event coming up January 27, 2018. If you're interested in it and you want to find out details, go to Facebook and, and like our Facebook page. There, we have an event um, situation on the Facebook page. Okay. So Ingrid's character, she's clearly looking for attachment security. And she, you know, when at the very beginning of the movie, we see her reaching out to this girl named Charlotte and Charlotte rejects her and she gets very upset and, and goes to her wedding and in a revenge way, uh, sprays mace in her face. Well, this is, this is a co comedic depiction or an exaggeration of borderline personality in which when, when you have borderline, you've been abused and abandoned and made to feel as though you're worthless. And you've also been made to feel as though you don't really exist in some ways. And so you emerge into adulthood with a very deep neurological condition in which you don't know who you are. And you also have trauma, very real, very, very similar to PTSD. Uh, in fact, a lot of research and a lot of uh, experts are starting to put PTSD on the same spectrum as borderline. So um, lower levels or a particular kind of trauma, you have PTSD. And then at, when it's another kind of trauma, it turns into complex PT, PTSD. And at higher levels, it turns into borderline. And so it, you're very much traumatized by this. And so as an adult, you're desperate for closeness because you've never had it. You're desperate for someone to love you because you've never had it. And so you reach out and you, you try and you, and then when someone comes along that gives you any sort of attention, like the way Charlotte did on the internet and the way that Taylor did, Elizabeth Olsen's character did on the internet, you instantly want a connection with that person because you're like, oh my God. Because the, the analogy I have is you're so hungry. You're so hungry for some attachment and attention that when you get just a crumb of a cracker, just a, just a tiny little crumb, you know, you haven't eaten in a week and you put that crumb on in your mouth and it just tastes so good and you just want more of it. And so when these two women commented on, on her internet post, it was that little crumb of acceptance, that little crumb of love and, and attention and friendship, true friendship. And so Aubrey Plaza's character, Ingrid, she just latches onto that. But, oh my God, that feels so good. I want more of that. And then she throws herself into that relationship and, and desperately grabs at the person. Well, what, what typically happens is people run away from that because they're like, I don't want to be desperately grabbed at. That doesn't feel good to me. And so they start rejecting, just like these two characters, these two women did. And so they, they rejected Aubrey Plaza's character, Ingrid. And that's when the trauma is, is, is touched upon and is um, poked at. That feeling of rejection, that feeling of abandonment, that feeling of betrayal is all triggered. And deep, deep pain emerges. And then a consequent deep, deep anger emerges after that pain is realized. Because when someone betrays you, your first reaction is to be hurt by it. But your second reaction is to get angry. And then maybe your third reaction is to get revenge. And that's what she did. You know, she, she sprayed mace in that girl's face. And then with 
the main plot with Aubrey Plaza and Elizabeth Olsen, she ended up trying to eliminate her brother to get him out of the way because he was he was a threat to her attachment security with with Elizabeth Olsen. So in this way, uh, it's it's very much in line with Borderline, and in terms of the way Borderline is often depicted, um, this is how it's often depicted in movies. You know, it it's it's trying to entertain, and so it's trying the movie's trying to have some comedy comedy about it. It's trying to make it. Uh, you know, they're trying to package it, a story together in an hour and a half. And so, you know, would I say, hey, if you want to know what Borderline is, watch Ingrid Goes West. No, I wouldn't do that. But I, I would say, watch Ingrid Goes West and then let's have a conversation, you know. But anyway, so then at the end, when she's totally rejected by Elizabeth Olsen's character, um, she completely falls apart. She, she desperately tries to reach out. It's not working. She's trying all these different angles to get back into her life. It's not working. And she feels terrible. And she and all that trauma is emerging. Now, they're not talking about that because they're trying to keep the story kind of tight. You know, they didn't want to... I could tell the writer was like, I'm not going to talk about her history. <laughs> I just want this to be a clean story about these two women. And maybe she has a bad history, but maybe she doesn't. We just don't know. Well, so I assume that if this character was real that she would have a very difficult childhood of abandonment and or abuse or both. And so she, all this, you know, emerges for her and she becomes suicidal because when you feel that bad, when you feel that worthless and you're alone with your thoughts and feelings and you're looking at yourself and you see nothing, that's one of the things about borderline that's very peculiar to me is that People with borderline will say, I, I don't know who I am. When I look at myself, I see a void. I'm empty. I'm broken. There's nothing on the inside. And it's terrifying. And so all those things are happening. And then she said, and, which, and for a lot of people in this situation, what they what will pop into their head is suicide. Because the suicide will end the suffering. It's, it's a way to, suicide is often called upon to end the suffering. The suffering is so great and they've tried so many things and so many things have not worked that they're like, you know what? Suicide is the only way. And so, so that's what she does. And in this moment, she lets go. She's like, well, if I'm going to die, I don't care if people see the real me because no one likes me anyway and, and I don't care. People can see who I am in all of my humiliation and so be it i don't care anymore i give up trying to impress people so so that to me felt very consistent with someone who had what i might characterize as mild to moderate borderline okay or severe preoccupied insecure attachment style so to me i felt like the movie depicted it responsibly Maybe it's just because I totally love Aubrey Plaza and everything she does. I don't know. But the style of the movie to me felt responsible to that, to that uh, mental condition. It also sprinkled in sort of comedy and intrigue and had, a, had some interesting scenes. And I, I, thought, I thought it was pretty good. And I thought it depicted suicide pretty responsibly too. And so when she wakes up in the morning after thinking she would be dead and she gets all those texts and she, now she's like, Oh, I'm getting accolades. I'm getting attention. But at the core, she still does not know who she is and she still lacks a sense of self. And she still has that trauma about being abandoned. And she's still very sensitive to abandonment. And she's still going to get very hurt the next time someone even hints about abandon, abandoning her. And she's still going to get very angry. All that is still there. But there's just a, a, a little five-second blip of time at the very end of this movie in which she thinks she has arrived. But of course, she has not arrived because the next, her, her, the ne if, we, if there's an Ingrid goes west too, Ingrid goes east, maybe we'd call it, she will, she'll start all over again. And the pain might even be worse because she's getting all this internet attention 
and yet still people close to her are, it's not working out for her. So, so to me, I, it felt responsible. Okay. So as I was preparing to do this episode, I started thinking, man, everyone's going to think I see borderline everywhere. <laughs> and I find that when I talk to my supervisees, I've, I find myself talking about borderline a lot. I, I think there's a number of reasons for that. One is, is that once I discovered the true nature of borderline and the true underlying reasons for borderline, I expanded my definition of borderline. So I have a very expanded view, like in my conceptualization of borderline is also elements of complex PTSD, which researchers have have established as a very related condition, if not on, if not basically just a variation of borderline or borderline is a variation of complex PTSD. But I've also extended it into preoccupied insecure attachment, anxious attachment style. And so it's, to me, it's a very, it's a much broader definition than I think a lot of people would, would give it. So that's one reason. Another reason is that I believe anecdotally and otherwise that borderline personality and, you know, anxious attachment style is a very common condition for people. It's, it's not rare. I think that a lot of people have it and I wouldn't label them as having a mental illness. You know, there, there are many people that I know personally and professionally who have insecure attachment styles that, you know, it, it's just a thing that they deal with, you know, it's not something that, um, we would characterize as a disorder. And so I think that's another reason why. Another reason why is because people who have borderline personality often will go to therapy for a number of reasons, because they are desperate for someone's attention because they've never had it in their life. No one has ever felt truly dedicated to them. No one's ever felt truly safe to them. And so they try a lot of different solutions to try to find that attachment security. And, th and then they think, you know what, maybe I'll try therapy. And then they go to therapy and they're like, oh my God, this might actually help me because I, I feel this feels good. This feels healing to me. This relationship with this therapist, this therapist who understands, who listens, who doesn't run away, who can handle it when um, I have an emotional reaction. This feels very healing to me. It's also terrifying to people with borderline because what if the therapist rejects them? You know, that's a very terrifying thing, the deeper their relationship gets. So that's another reason why I find myself talking about borderline a lot is because a lot of uh, of the people who suffer from various different conditions, borderline people are just much more likely to seek help with a therapist. For example, if you have an avoidant personality, the chance that you're going to go to therapy is, is a lot less because you avoid things like that. So, um, so I think that's another reason why I talk about borderline. Another reason why I talk about borderline a lot is I'm realizing now that movies, as I said earlier, and writers and TV shows love to talk about border. They love to have characters that, that have elements of borderline off the top of my head. I can think of many movies that depict borderline things like the cable guy, which I did an episode on girl interrupted fatal attraction, single white female gone girl, etc. Now you could argue that these aren't actual or they're not accurate depictions of, of borderline or they're extremely exaggerated, horrific versions of borderline, which I would say is true also. But for whatever reason, we love, for whatever reason, our society loves to tell stories about particularly women, but some men who become very obsessed on people and stalk people and become very hurt when they get rejected. There's just something, I don't know, just something very interesting about that dynamic to us. Not sure why. I thought about other diagnoses that, that tend to get a lot of airplay. Obviously, psychopathy, antisocial personality gets a lot, you know, things like Mindhunter and Game of Thrones, American Psycho, Nightcrawler, Silence of the Lambs, Clockwork Orange, No Country for Old Men, and, and many, many more. We loved having, because there's nothing more, we love villains and heroes, and there's nothing more villainous than a psychopath, <laughs> um, Star Wars for that matter. We also like sexual sadism, right? Uh, Game of Thrones has a lot of sexual sadism. Also, uh, the accused, 
um, has sexual sadism in it, and many, many more. We have a, a, another uh, affinity for PTSD. I'm actually watching the new Netflix show, The Punisher. It's a, it's a, I think it's Marvel. It's a Marvel character, one of the uh, lesser known Marvel characters, maybe, The Punisher. But um, it deals with PTSD, and um, I, I've watched the first couple episodes. It's, it's pretty good. I, I like it. Uh, of those new super superhero Netflix shows, I find that The Punisher is one of the better ones. Um, Deer Hunter, Jacob's Ladder, American Sniper, these all deal with PTSD. And they, PTSD in movies and TV is almost always with regards to war veterans. It's almost never with regards to what I consider to be the majority of PTSD sufferers is from uh, sexual trauma or abuse trauma from being raised with uh, abusive parents, physically abusive parents, scary parents. Dissociative identity disorder is also another thing that's often depicted, like the movie Split, which we did an episode on, the United States of Terra, that TV show, and Fight Club. Obsessive compulsive disorder is another thing that gets depicted, um, kind of, like As Good As It Gets or Aviator, Matchstick Men, and the TV show Monk. Um, you know, for some reason, I think OCD is just funny to people. Um, it's depicted, I think, quite poorly in these. I think Aviator depicts it probably the, the most accurately. OCD is a terrible it's a terrible condition. It's not like, it's not the way it's depicted in movies and TV where it's just sort of this cute little compulsion that people do. OCD ruins people's lives. It, it is so pervasive for most people. It just, it, it completely immobilizes them. It makes it so they can't even think another thought. They can, you know, there are people who suffer from OCD that when they're in the throes of their symptomology, all their brain can do for 24 seven is focus on the terror that their brain is choosing to focus on for whatever reason. So movies like Monk and Matchstick Men and As Good As It Gets, it's like, you know, because the thing is, is if you, if you depicted OCD in a re, in a real way, it's not entertaining. There's nothing entertaining about it. It's just tragic. There's nothing funny about it. There's nothing interesting about it. It's just horrible to see. And so, uh, you know, Hollywood likes to take these things and depict it and make it interesting. Same with dissociative identity disorder. You know, it's often depicted as this sort of cute, like, oh, I have multiple personalities. Oh, no, 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 no. People who have dissociative identity disorder are extremely upset and and terrified and demoralized by the fact that their brain doesn't work correctly you know it's a very terrifying thing um other other uh conditions that are depicted in in the media are addiction is you know like requiem for a dream train spotting 28 days less than zero flight flight uh man with um with uh, denzel is one of the best depictions of addiction I've ever seen. It's a flight. If you want to see, it's actually a pretty good movie too, but if you want to see addiction, like real addiction, watch flight. Cause a lot of movies, when they depict addiction and TV shows, 99% of the time they make it look like, you know, like they'll have a, someone drinking a lot, but they're not slurring their words and they're not, their brain isn't completely, you know, dysfunctional. They're just sort of like happy or funny or something. And it's like, no, when people, everyone has seen super drunk people before, right? And super drunk people, are, there's just nothing entertaining about them. They're just, it's a very sad thing to see. And flight depicts that pretty well. Um, I mean, it doesn't go full bore, but it, you know, it gets at like, just how pervasive the compulsion is to drink. Uh, other addiction movies, Sid Nancy, Half Nelson, Don John has deals with porn addiction. But okay, so th so those we can say, you know, are pretty popular movies that depict borderline, psychopathy, PTSD, dissociative identity disorder, o OCD, addiction. But there are so many other condition categories that people suffer from, like 
What about other anxiety disorders like panic disorder or, or generalized anxiety disorder or real OCD? And what about all the other personality disorders, histrionic, paranoids, you know, uh, schizoid, schizotypal, dependent, avoidant? Um, what about autism, real autism, not like, ooh, autism gives me special powers, you know? <laughs> what about like actual autism? Um, the way, you know, people who actually work with autistic people out there, you know that the way people think about autism because of the way that the media has portrayed it is not, uh, not the vast majority of the reality of autism. Um, but I won't get into that further. Uh, real ADHD, real bipolar, real depression. Depression is an extremely common condition, but it's never depicted in movies and TV. I suspect because real depression is not entertaining. You know, how, how do you make a movie with a character who doesn't want to even leave their bedroom to even go to the bathroom, let alone have a story arc, you know? So real depression isn't depicted, real, real dissociation, um, eating disorders, to the bone was, was pretty good, but, um, but yeah, real eating disorders are often not depicted, real sexual issues, and the list goes on and on. There, so for whatever reason, borderline is just one of those things that it, it, it lends itself to entertainment in this weird way. And so that's another reason why I, I find myself talking about borderline a lot <laughs> in terms of depictions in the media. All right. So bottom line, Inger Goes West, I think is a entertain. It's a, it, it balances well the entertainment, you know, it balances well between providing an entertaining interesting uh, story about somebody who wants something and then has a fall from grace, but then ultimately kind of gets it in the end. It, it balances that whole thing with the reality of borderline and the reality of young people's folk eye at this point. And I thought, I thought it was really good. Stylistically, it's 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 fun to watch. Um, there's this whole thing with Wyatt Russell's character in that he is a an artist, and the way he makes art is he finds old paintings that other people have made, and then he puts these big hashtags on them. You know, like hashtag LOL. He'll just put this. It'll take someone's old painting that of like a prairie with buffalo on it and he'll put hashtag lol just right across the front and and it it's an interesting way of uh the whole movie a asks a lot of questions about contemporary art and contemporary um efforts at creation and how everything is sort of a recycled something of someone else's and everything is like what trying to make yourself look a certain way or sort of false celebrity and and false selfhood and but it doesn't do it in a way that feels dismissive of young people it feels like it understands young people because the writer director is a young person while at the same time commenting on that particular kind of culture um so I recommend it again, eight out of 10. I could imagine some people not liking it. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what, you know, what sort of person you'd have to be to like it. I, I imagine if you're, I'm just taking a guess and saying if you're a young person, you'd, prob you'd probably like it. If you like anything Aubrey Plaza does, you'll like it, I would think. Um, if you're interested by my description of this whole thing, my guess is you might be interested in it. I don't know. Anyway, well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me out there. Please take care of yourself because why? Why? Because you deserve it. <laughs>